Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week we learned that getting cross-threaded with God can cost you some prime real estate and undercut the length and quality of your life as well. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and out of Eden they went. And out of the perfect relationship with God and the garden they had been created to enjoy. This week you get to watch as another relationship goes sour. The relationship between the people God created to enjoy his creation together. God announced early on that it is not good for man to be alone. But God wasn't just referring to the need to add the female to the mix to be able to make more humans. God could have made as many of us as he wanted of either gender the same way he made the first ones. God created people not just to be persons, individuals, but to become populations, to live and grow in community with each other and in covenant together with him. But it wasn't long after people started being born the biological way that the trouble between them began. Eve gives birth to a couple of boys, Cain and Abel, and though she is happy to get them, that happiness will not last forever. Her sons will be different, and that difference will ultimately destroy the lives of both. The Bible says they have different jobs, different ways of life when they grow up. But the difference that brings the danger isn't their doing. It's God's. Cain, the farmer, and Abel, the shepherd, both want to worship God. Both bring their best offering to him. If there is anything wrong with either of them in what they've done or how they've done it, the Bible says nothing about it. But God responds differently to these two brothers as they attempt to worship him. He accepts one offering and rejects the other. Cain is the one rejected, and somehow Cain knows this, senses this. God has not blessed Cain the way he has blessed Abel. And Cain feels the unfairness of it, as we feel all the unfairness we have experienced in life, and all the frustration of not knowing why things don't work out well for us when we try our hardest and do our best. Why him and not me? And a lot of times, we just don't know. And we're not going to know in this life. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. But it's awfully hard to wait till by and by. We live in the now. Things happen now. And whatever God is doing, it's awfully hard to know for sure what it is God is doing specifically right now. On the other hand, maybe it's you who's being blessed and the other guy who's not, or at least not as much as you. Maybe he or she is mad at you because things are going well for you, which of course makes you mad at him or her because you're just doing the best you can like everybody else. Something is always getting in the way of our getting along with each other, it seems, no matter who's got the short end of the stick. And that's when God finally shows up at Cain's doorstep. It's hard to get mad at God when things aren't going right for you, or when they are and everyone else is mad at you because of it. But there's always your brother or sister 
or somebody human around you, somebody human and different, whether a little or a lot, to take your frustrations out on. Of course, in the story, Cain's only got Abel. It may be too early in the development of human psychology for Cain to realize that he can be mad at his mama and daddy too. Cain's only got his brother Abel to take his anger out on, but his brother will do well enough. Except that God is against the idea. Cain couldn't get God to give his offering a thumbs up, but his hostility toward the only other person around gets Cain a clearly defined divine thumbs down. Cain, my boy, don't do what you're thinking about doing to your brother. But God says it in a way that makes you think he's more concerned about what Cain is going to do to himself than about what Cain is planning to do to Abel. Sin went after Cain's parents in the form of a serpent, subtle, sly, and suggestive. But sin has taken on a different form as it takes Cain on. Sin is now a lion lying at Cain's doorstep, competing with God for Cain's soul, crouching to leap into Cain's heart if Cain will not open his heart to God. Cain, my boy, says God, think about what you're going to do to yourself if you decide to do to your brother what you shouldn't do. Think about what you're going to do to your relationship with me if you destroy your relationship with your brother. Think about the fact that your relationship with God involves every other human being in existence. Think about the fact that God has entered into every relationship you have with another individual. Whether relationship is positive or negative, healthy or fractured, God is a part of it. Nothing you do or say or think or feel in relation to another person is unconnected to God. It's kind of like when Jesus told a crowd of people, what you do to the least of these my brothers, you do to me. And Cain is told by God on the brink of a disaster of Cain's own choosing, you can do what is right right now. You can do what is right, and you should for your sake, as well as for the sake of the one you want to hurt. Because if you don't, you will hurt yourself as much as, if not more than, the person you are planning to hurt. Maybe that's why Jesus said, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Cain had more to fear from God if he took his brother's life than Abel had to fear from Cain when Cain killed him. And Cain did kill him. Abel, his brother, his innocent brother, even after God warned him not to, even after God told Cain what sin would do to him and with him if and when he did the evil deed. And it was evil. And we all know it. Which is why murder of your brother or anyone else is not the point of the story. Jesus may have had this story and the point of it in mind when he came to the place in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. God confronted Cain about his murderous intent before Cain committed murder. Jesus confronted the intent in those who had never committed the act. Have you been angry with anyone lately? 
Have you insulted anyone or wanted to? Have you called anybody names uh, face to face or behind the back or just in your own mind? Don't raise your hand. We're all guilty to some degree, sooner or later. It is the way we are and why we are in our hearts just like Cain. God warns us, urges us away from the open door where sin waits to pounce upon us. And so often, far too often, we will not back away from doing what we desire to do to others in thought or word or deed. And we sin against God and man and sin devours our life like the hungry lion it is. And it can happen right under God's nose, as it did with Cain. God went to see Cain about his hatred problem. And Cain went right out after God spoke to him and did the exact opposite of what God told him to do. And Cain did what he did, not so much because he didn't like his brother. Cain went after his brother because he wasn't happy about the way God was treating him. And figure things would be better if his brother wasn't in the way. God would have to accept Cain and his offering because after Abel was removed from the process, Cain's offering would be the only one offered. But Jesus said, If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God told Cain before he did the thing he should not do, don't do it. But Cain did it anyway. And God still came back to Cain, first to confront Cain with his knowledge of what Cain had done, and then to endure Cain's indifference, lies, and blatant disrespect as God pronounced the divine and natural curse on Cain his actions had brought down upon him. The one who killed his brother will now have to wander the earth looking for a family. The one who spilled his brother's blood on the ground that provided him food to feed himself and make an offering to God will find the ground no longer willing to give up its bounty to him. The sinner is now at odds with the people around him and the earth beneath his feet and the God above his head. He is now as defenseless in the world as his brother was with him. And Cain now understands the true wages of sin. And he cries out to the God that he would not listen to. And the God who judges Cain guilty listens and grants the murderer the mercy he would not grant his innocent brother. God places a mark upon Cain required by Cain's guilt but revealing God's grace. It is the sign of God's continuing presence despite the sin and the seal of God's ongoing protection. And we who are sinners like Cain, who have sinned against God and our brothers and sisters, we may also bear a mark, a symbol that signifies both our guilt, and God's grace to overcome it. It is a mark traced in innocent blood across our hearts. We wear it around our necks and hang it on our walls and raise it in our churches. And it says to us that by and by we will understand it better. When the morning comes and our relationships with all our brothers and sisters and God himself, relationships so marred by sin, will be restored to the state God intended. 
And we will be the covenant community He always meant for us to be. And all the Abels will welcome all the Cains back home to the family of God. Through Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, whose sprinkled blood, the Bible says, speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Amen.